the Institute of World Politics. We are actually a school, and we offer five master degrees and one doctoral program. And we also have 19 certificate programs. And the latest uh, latest program that we've added is in cyber intelligence, okay, which is a little bit different than cyber security. So we take the cyber, take the intelligence, and where those two, the, the, the little thing there where they meet, that's cyber intelligence. So how, how do they interact and so on. And when you think about it, we, we know that technology and cyber is ubiquitous across all. So if you think of all the, all the statecraft that exists, so espionage and uh, human intelligence and signet, you know, all those things, and then you take and apply cyber to it, then you have cyber intelligence. So that's what that's about. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the speaker, Ari Bose, today. Um, but that, I would consume the entire time. Okay? So I've known Ari for a long time. Um, and, and I want you to know he's now currently the CEO and president of Terai um, Industries. And um, he's going to get more into that and tell you about that. So I'm going to tell you the stuff about Ari's past that I can tell you about. Um, he was the, the CIO at, at major companies, um, UT Starcom was one, um, I guess uh, Polycom, if you've heard, have you heard of Polycom? And Brocade Communications, have you heard about that? Uh, big, these are, you know, big, well-known companies, and uh, and he's, he, you know, he's been in the Silicon Valley for, like, a million years, uh, but he he then moved to Arizona. needed needed to warm up. So, um, and he'll he'll get into it. But uh, I would tell you, I've known Ari for a long time, and he's not just your typical CIO. He actually understands business. He understands the um, the time management. He understands. Um, the financing of it, the accounting of it. Um, he, he understands performance and profitability, and he's been in all these roles. So um, what I'm trying to convey to you that he's pretty much an authority on, on what he's going to talk to you about. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ari Bose. Yeah. Thank you, Dean. So, a um, little bit about why I started this company. <clears throat> uh, at the root of it all, I love innovation. I love technology and, <clears throat> you know, I, having done this operational role for, I don't know, 20 years of CIO, I figured, you know, I wanted to get into something more that was challenging to myself. <clears throat> it got me going, getting up in the morning. And one of the things I had a big problem was in my career was with, you know, information security. Uh, <clears throat> every quarter we'd have a board meeting and the board would get up and I'd have to present to them our cybersecurity posture. And they would say, you know, give us your standard report. And my team would spend weeks getting information from all our different systems, putting together a presentation. And <clears throat> we'd do it and then it would have things like average spend by high technology and security, how many dedicated security personnel you have, what do you do for email, firewall, all of that infrastructure. And then look at me at the end of the thing and say, so are we safe? <clears throat> and, you know, hard to say. It's very subjective information, right? So we started thinking about this and said, is there a way to make it completely objective and leave any interpretation out of it. Come up with metrics that will spell out where you are today and where you need to be. <clears throat> and we started using, um, you know, ISO 27001, NIST, these standards. So we settled on ISO 27001 and we came up with the metrics. And it was very hard to compute those metrics 
looking at every single source system, you know, from network routers to firewalls to applications. But we could do it in about 45 days, giant spreadsheets. So that's what I, when I came out of there, I said, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. Is there a way to automate this whole cybersecurity management process? And can we do it in an effective way that companies can look at it and it'll pinpoint the few critical things they need to fix in their entire infrastructure versus the hundreds of tickets these system generate every day. <clears throat> and my team would be tearing their hair out because they'd go like, okay, what do we need to patch? Windows, Unix, Linux, okay, applications, uh, you know, firewalls, you know, what, what, what's the priority? Can't do them all. These tools are telling us, you know, on any one day I broke it, uh, we had about, you know, 8,000 employees. Uh, and we would get about uh, 250 to 260 tickets a day to fix. <clears throat> Packages would be coming in. You know, <clears throat> we'd get the NIST feeds. Uh, they would give us vulnerabilities. So it was, you couldn't keep on top of it. It was just crazy. So we figured out what do we need to do to make it simple, easy to manage. And that's how we started this thing. So I'll just walk you through this. And how many of you guys use standards to manage your infrastructure? No? Okay. Have we thought about it? Okay. Uh uh. Could I find this? The number two reason for me not doing a CIRO anymore. What happens to me is the world meeting. Then we would get up and the radio system would stop free. And then all of every meeting. So, anyway, so no big. So, what has happened in the last you know, decade or so is things have gotten more complex. And this is kind of a beauty slide, but it tells you that the threat landscape in the middle here is exponentially increased. With things like IoT and, you know, um, Cloud, you know, mobile, all of that has just, you know, made the threat, you know, vectors, you know, multiply by 10. And so you see that is increasing, and then you can also see how much people are spend, spending on security annually, and that's you know, almost a hundred billion dollars in 18, and it's, you know, 19 is actually 10% higher than that. So 
that this slide kind of tells you that the threat industry is evolving, and as we keep developing tools, you know, we try to stay ahead and find new ways of getting into your infrastructure. And <clears throat> started up, and you know, used to have post based antivirus. Then we got into the IPS idea that I'm sure every company is deploying that today. Um, <clears throat> then we had things in the you know intelligence and analytics today, and in 19 and 20. <clears throat> So it's a crowded marketplace, and there's a lot of great solutions that, you know, I'm sure you guys use a lot of them today, every, you know, for desktop, or servers, or firewalls. Um, you can see that there's a lot, there goes to the rest of companies. But even with all of that tools that people have, you know, the threats and breaches that keep occurring. So there's some kind of a disconnect between what's going on here, yeah, very good tools, but at the end of the day, you still get the breaches. And I'll walk you through a few of these things that have happened in the recent, you know. So if you look at, I'll give you the Uber, that's a really great example, right? Uh, they have a ton of infrastructure installed there, secure infrastructure. And I actually know their CISO, it's part of a group, advisory group. Um, what happened was they had a GitHub server on their public network. And that server had a default user ID and password admin as it. <clears throat> and I said, how come you guys didn't know about that? He said, yeah, we have 7,000 servers with that. And they have about 140,000, you know, worth of machines. And of them, 7,000 had that. And we were going after them one by one. It just so happened we had not gotten this one. <clears throat> so, you know, I'll, I, I can walk you through that, but you know, similar thing that because of the volume of, you know, vulnerabilities that people have today in the systems, there's not an easy way to look at everything across the entire infrastructure and point out the three or four things you need to fix right away. You know, a prioritized way of fixing your problem. Every single, if you have vertical tools, they'll tell you what to fix in your mobile device, they'll tell you what to fix in your servers, you know, nobody looks at it holistically across end to end and tells you of all the stuff you have, here's the 10 things you need to fix. Now that becomes more manageable for IT security practice. So what we thought of was we would use, you know, the CIS controls. You guys know about CIS controls, right? Uh, and we said, why don't we use the CIS controls? It's an industry standard approach. And if we look at their latest version of the thing that up three now, um, why don't we figure out a way to automate these controls across the entire infrastructure? And our first, you know, thought was work on just the basics, right? And if you can get those basics under control, you can get reduce your vulnerability by 80%. So that was our first thought. Let's start there and then we'll progress on with future releases. And the first basic is, you know, you know, if you look at it from a CIS perspective, we start reading about it, but if you look at it, take yourself away from there and say, if I knew every single device that's connected to my network, right, that would be a huge thing plus for me. I need to know whoever is connecting, wired, wireless, mobile, you know, iPad. <clears throat> so if I can get a handle on all those devices, the second thing is if I knew all those devices and if they were all wife tested devices, they were authorized, then I'm good. But if I know if anybody is connected that's not in my whiteboard, that's a problem I need to look at right away. So that somebody's trying to you know, hack into my system. Once you have that, you look to the second. And the second control says, if all the devices that are connected, do you have a control over what's installed on them? Are they authorized software? Okay, so I have a question. So in order to know all the devices on your network, the ones that are connected, like a, a, a desktop machine or even a laptop that's internal, what about when people go home and they start to log in? So the question is, how long does it take before you actually know this is the population? Um, okay, so let's take mobile devices. Maybe that's a good example. Um, how many of you guys manage mobile devices in your environment today? You do? 
What do you use? Mobile Iron or what do you use? Software? Oh. No software. What do you do manage them? Yeah. Okay, so there's solutions out there like Mobile Iron or you can even use Intune. Microsoft people use Intune now. And they manage, they, you have to register your device into that system for you to access the assets. So, <clears throat> we don't go to each single device. We go to Microsoft Intune you know, and say, where are all the devices connected to your network? Right. And then we look at Microsoft and say, are these valid devices? Right. So we can identify the anomalies between Cisco reporting, Cisco wireless controller reporting, there's 150 devices connected to your network. Intune says you only have 120, <laughs> 30 devices in our system. Then we look at the IP address and we tell you these are the guys that are. And it could be that they just didn't listen to IT and went and bought a new iPhone, right, and connected. So it could be a valid, you know, false positive. But you'd rather know about every single false positive and negative than not know about them. So that's how that works. Once you get a hold of the software that's installed on them, you can figure out if there's any servers running, server apps that are OS is not patched, apps are not patched. Uh, users downloading apps on their own and ins installing that are not supported. So you need to get a handle of, on that. Third one is you can get every network device and access and software access on them. Corral, you have good control of your environment. Then you got to look at your network. And when you look at a network, you got to look at ports open. You know all those not network vulnerabilities that you got to look at. If you can protect them, you're pretty much halfway home there. You know, it's a big ask. But if, if I could, I'll tell you how we can go about automating all of that, right? So it's not a humongous administrative task for you. The fourth one is the GitHub thing, right? So this one will tell you, IT people have administrative access to accounts to manage, you know. So it looks at everything that administrative account and says, how often was it used? If one of them was locked out, I want to know what those are. And if they're locked out and it's a valid reason somebody forgot the password, it's fine. But if somebody was trying to hack in and they tried all kinds of passwords and it's locked out, then you know you have a problem there, right? Apart from that, it'll also tell you every single default password being used in the system. So people in Uber would know that. And granted, in this way, it'll tell you that hundred of them, right? But the way this looks at it, it looks at divide your entire infrastructure into three zones. First one is public facing zone. Anybody from outside that can access your assets. The second one is the DMZ. And the third one is your internal network, right? Corporate network. So the system looks at that and says, you have a server sitting in your public zone, which is the most critical and it has a default password. So it would be highlighting that as a very high priority issue. Right? So they would have focused in on it right away. Secure configuration, uh, you know, a lot of industries use that. So in terms of if you're into credit card processing, PCI, PCI gives you a certain configuration for every single asset, server, OS. If you use that, it'll tell you if any of the configurations have been tampered with. So it will detect anomaly. Uh, in case of retail, that's important because if a POS system has this payment card schema installed on it, it will instantly tell you there's this one POS machine that has an unsupported configuration. Right? So then the IT guys can take it offline. Right? The last one, you know, the sixth one is something that you know not a lot of people use, and it's I don't know why it's in the basic configuration, but it basically looks at do you have a same solution? Do you guys use same at all? Any, any of the IBM or logarithms or you know <clears throat> things like that? No. Most people don't. It's a very expensive solution, but what they do is they send logs out to these companies from all these systems, and they look at your logs and try to you know do some analytics and tell you here's some correlation, and I can see this problem, and they'll give you a ticket to open. What this control does is, it doesn't do that work, but it looks at if you're sending logs, are you sending them with the right logs? Is it going on regularly? And it also looks at 
when you're getting tickets coming out of the log, are you gaining on solving them or are you creating a big backlog? Are you falling behind addressing them? So that's the basic controls you have. So what we took these controls, and if you look at the CIS, uh, they sent out a massive worksheet. And each of the controls have about 10 to 12 different attributes. Right, so we took all of that and this is our solution. So what we did was we took those controls and we created a framework where we, we can ask customers to go in and say, what kind of uh, standard do you want to use to mitigate your risk? Some would say NIST, some would say 27,001, you know, uh, medical companies would say biotech would say HIPAA. So we, based on the standards, we created a whole set of algorithms to compute the KPIs for those standards, based on those standards. Then the defense engine transformed those standards into algorithms, a way to calculate those KPIs. And then we have a collection engine that connects to your infrastructure and constantly collects information to front. And you can set the collection engine to collect every minute, every hour, every day, depending on you know how soon you want to collect information. And the last piece is an automation and orchestration. So what it does is it lets you create dashboard, it gives you remediation. Uh, it tells you what you need to fix from an on a prioritized basis. And it gives you trending thresholds. You can set a threshold, say, I'm just starting off on my cybersecurity, you know, improvement program, and I don't I can't be hundred percent on everything. So I'm gonna set my threshold for say eighty, I'll improve it by two points every quarter. So that way your you know your indicators will reflect an eighty percent completion. Uh, I'll, I'll show you what that is. The biggest thing is, you know, a principal benefit is it, it prioritizes all your vulnerabilities into few critical ones that you need to fix. <clears throat> and you know, the and what we have seen is nobody is doing it across your entire infrastructure. Most players have gone very vertical. You know, you have a firewall vendor, or you have, you know, a vendor that does uh, mobile security, or you know, so they just fix their own area. So, you know, what are the benefits of this stuff? You have complete visibility into your cyber security operation. At any one point, I'll show you the you know, dashboard. You can look at a dashboard and say, here's where I'm at. Here's where my yellows are, here's where my greens are, here's my reds, and what do I need to do? Return them. Running it, the dashboard operates, you know, refreshes as soon as you collect data. So minutes, days, months, and you can look at it your program and say, you know what, I'm improving, I'm gaining every week by week, I can see any progress. If not, you can see that as well. <clears throat> it can also give you a throughput of progress for every area that you have critical vulnerabilities. So you can look at, let's say you have a ton of vulnerabilities in your unit here, and you're not making progress, it will show you that. So you say, okay, I've got to hire a contractor get beyond this, right? So at, at a very detailed level. It, importantly, you know, it gives you visibility of your tools deployed today because it's get, gathering information from your tools. So it tells you what you've implemented in infrastructure, firewalls, are they doing the right thing? Are they deployed right? And then from a management perspective, you know, <clears throat> the first three or four of them we looked at from information security and operations, what do people need to get the job done? Management, it provides information about program maturity, right? So now you can go to a board meeting and create a standard set of dashboard and categorically say where you are. And, you know, you're saying that's a standard based approach. It's not you came up with some data and put it up in front of them. Uh, <clears throat> the last one is important, right? Management can see how you're improving your stuff. And it, it's a tool that, you know, if I had it when I was CIO, I could go in there and say, you know what, I'm way behind, I need funding. For me to move the dial, and I and here's exactly what I need for every single thing, and which ones you guys want to prioritize. So this is what it looks like, right, from a backward perspective. So 
This one is using race 800. So that the first one is inventory and control of hardware assets. Can you guys see it? So in the network access index on top, and you can see this is IA3, it gives you the sub indexes for the control. It tells you this one is set at 80% threshold, so he's at 94.5, so it's showing green. Then each of the sub indexes are showing what it is for remote access, wired, wireless, and the end. And these things turn green, yellow, red based on the threshold. So if it is, if it become any of these become yellow, you can click on it, and it will give you a next level view of what's by the yellow, what's what's going on in that area. At this graph you see is when you click on the 94.5, it shows you how you're doing for the last five periods, whether you're going up or down, lower. <clears throat> you can actually click on any of these things and give you a description of the control and how you want to interpret it. Understand what the controls are. So this is the standard dashboard for every control we develop. That's right. So the first six I talked to you about are those six dashboards you see on your right there. Uh, if you do this, it's eighty-four percent really. You can use that if that's what the C, uh, standard you tells you on CIS controls. And depending on your industry, you make a ten of these controls change. So I'll give you a deep dive into, we talked about this pretty much, right? So it tells you manage and optimize all devices connected to the network. So in this one, let's just say that, you know, the wireless was yellow, okay, for the sake of our description. You would get this step. So it tells you that here are all the device IDs, here are all the users, the mobile device, here's the status today. This guy has bought a new device, verification is pending, he hasn't verified the machine yet. Or, and the reason is, the policy is out of date, somebody needs to push him a new certificate. So it gives you what you need to do to turn that dial green. Okay, on the mobile device. And in this case, this example, what you should use Seeing the severity level is critical. On mobile devices, it's interesting. Uh, the use case we use with one of our pilots, what he said was, I don't really care about every single mobile phone out there. I want to make sure the executive phones are secure because they're given corporate phones. And if they lose their phones, they have a lot of information on those phones that could be a challenge for us if it gets out there. So this guy filtered only the executives Whose phones were out? Policy. Now you could set the system up to say I want everyone, right? If you have a really strong BYOD policy, or you could just say, you know, we don't really manage mobile phones, so I'll turn this dial off. Software assets, uh, it's a, you know, same thing. So you have, you know, what it's looking at is looking at your whitelist. So you have, you have a whitelist of apps that you say are authorized. In the company we use. It looks at the whitelist. It also looks at every single asset that you have, the apps, and tells you the 84% says you have 16% of apps that are not on your whitelist. People have installed themselves on their machines, whether it's, you know, this is everything, right? Even routers, all devices connected. And then the attribute is something some companies use where you, they define a set of attributes usually used for managing licenses. That every single asset software that I have has to have a license count, has to have you know authorization. So they, the set of attributes that fix that measure that do these software have those attributes populated. So it's in this case, it's showing six percent off. The threshold is a ninety, so it's still green. Um, this one's pretty important. It tells you that you have. 13% of assets are free to end of life. You have apps that have unsupported. So either you need to upgrade them or replace them. And the next slide will give you what those are. Uh, I didn't add them in, but there is a, if you click on this, it'll tell you what are the apps that are unsupported end of life. And then you have to sit down and figure out what you want to do about it. So. This is 
really important. So this is the network control, right? So it looks at vulnerabilities across the network. And as I said, we divide it into perimeter, which is really public, DMD, and corporate. In this case, you know, the, the system will prioritize public over everything else. So they want you to fix the upper shell first so nobody can get in. Right? Whereas if you have a solution that's looking at a network, it will give you every single vulnerability across all. We felt that if you can protect your assets in the company from outside in first, you have a hard shell, people can't get in. You have more time to fix internally. Corporate would be something that Dean would be focusing on. So this is inside the strategy. Right? <clears throat> so this is how we do it. Passive ray is you know scan done with no authentication. You get a scanner outside the network, it just hits your network and tries to figure out what to get to. Activists, you know, companies like where I was, you would say all our finances systems are very critical. So I'm going to give you an authenticated login. You try to kind of see how far you can get in with those. So it's doing an active scan and telling you. In this case, they're pretty good. They're at 94 point percent. So when you look at the critical vulnerability there, right? In this case, we said the public was clean. The DMZ had critical vulnerabilities, we give you the IP address, host name, what's the vulnerability, and what's the patch to apply, right? And if you guys are familiar with the uh, CDSS scores, are you familiar with that? Uh, it gives you the highest scores for us, yeah, which is critical. Seven to 10 is critical. So it tells you only those are being shown here. You could say, you could get good at it and get all the 10 done, you could go ahead and say, show me the next level, medium ones. So it tells you what to fix to, you know, for a network remediation. We talked about this, administrative log scripts, IT accounts, it tells you by app, network, Windows, Unix, and other, right? Uh, some companies, you guys use them, okay? No? You do. It's, uh, it's measured multi-factor authentication. It keeps running it. <clears throat> the last one is really password rate, which is the default password. And this can tell you 14% of your apps have default passwords. So, what, so this is what it shows you, right? So it tells you these are all critical, these are the IP addresses, there's a host name, here's the vulnerability solution. This password never expires, you need to set expiration for the password. So it tells you by critical nature what do you need to This is secure for integration. I don't, not a lot of people use it, but we just talked about it, right? If you're using, you know, federal government uses US GCP standard, right? If you use that, it tells you exactly what you need to configure your server set. You know? <clears throat> so this will look at it and tell you how many of them have anomalies to what configuration standard says you have. What servers, what are they, which ones are they to fix? Same thing with template policy. Uh, a lot of companies use, you know, a CNS template to drive images. So desktop, each desktop has a standard image. It measures those. Credentials, template. If you have a server that stores all the gold images of your system, do we have a policy applied to that standard template that anybody, nobody can get into them? Right, so an authorized that. So that's the last one. In this case, it looks at, and it gives you all of those vulnerabilities that you need to you know, repeat it. The last one I told you about is you're using a safe to track logs. It looks at how many logs you can be this guy setting up seven. He's 100% on them every month. He sends seven logs in green. Uh, collection drift. So he's at 99 percent of collect collection. Rate really is a log that you send, and if they have any incomplete, you know, log sent, it tells you how many. You sent seven, and over the last month you have sent seven, but in this case you sent six, so it's showing the rest of missing one log. If you click on it, it'll tell you didn't send the unit log, whatever the one that didn't log. I found that this is the most important one. It says the folders. <coughs> 
stick is raised by your same solution, you're at 94.47 percent. So you're pretty much keeping track of the biggest thing that you're fixing them. And since the last time you measured, you're up one percent. So you're actually gaining ground. So that's sort of the solution. So you know, what are the how do we do it in our solution? So I told you we have all the standard engines. So we crunch those, create algorithms out of those. <coughs> Uh, so we have this pattern graph, and we store them in a Hadoop <coughs> cluster. Then we take, we have connectors for all your infrastructure. So we plug into your infrastructure. It's using REST API, and we don't install any of this. So we just give a user ID password, read only, and it collects the information. So we have all these today. And then <coughs> we also have a defense engine that has algorithms and reductions and correlation engine that takes all the data and correlates them all. And then you saw all the dashboards that does your visualization. Sort of uh, all I have today. Questions for you? What do you guys think? It's up to me. What do you do with a lot of these companies? I'm doing research on them. <laughs> Most don't, they don't know where all their data is. They don't have control. So how are you able to really Protect them and you mm -hmm. go across the whole infrastructure they don't even know. That's a good question. So, I've had a few people do that, right? So, say, okay, you guys can do all this, but how do I know I'm collecting all the right data for you to do this? Right? So, we have, we have a questionnaire, and the questionnaire walks through each control and what tools we have today, what energy you have, you don't have to say that, right? So, we, we do a, like a one week. Come by, come by and do the questionnaire work with the team, uh, hand, fill it up, and say, you know what, you can't really do it in mobile device management because you don't have the process and facilities in place. Right? So we identify those gaps. So, and more often than not, there are gaps. And we haven't run into a single customer that says, you go in there and screen field it's like, oh, same day. You know, it. So you're right, but you know, unless you go through the exercise, you won't know this. And when you do that, you have a holistic way of addressing it completely. Do they often, after you show them the vulnerabilities, do they then say, okay, we're going to reduce the amount of people who have access? Or because a lot of times they don't even know who has access. Um, so the way this, the, you, the, this system, you can configure for access, right? So you have admin access, you only access, you can con configure by control. So, you know, the mobile device management even and desktop services can only look at that control, right? So they have access to that, they can take care of it. They don't need to worry about using a network, applications, right? So we segregate that. But in terms of access controls across the enterprise for the source solution, we don't play that. No. Other questions? What do you guys think? Well, I have seen some other technologies I mean, like this, but not exactly like this. This is a combination of like three or four different uh, yeah. software that I have seen so far. Uh, you know, patch or configuration management, uh, risk analysis, remediation, sniffing. I mean, that's <laughs> practically collecting. Uh, the data, uh, and you just put it all in, and there's, a, I guess, a magic sauce there that you do the interpretation. Yeah. And thresholds are set by your company, right? This this company. No, Not the customer. I mean, exactly. because your interpretations are based on whatever algorithm that you created. Actually, no. There's two different ways to do this. So one is we've seen some customers come to us and say, we want to set the thresholds mm -hmm. because we know we're not. 100% on where we are, where we need to be. So we'll set it 80, 90. Or we can look at our database and say, you know, you're in manufacturing, and our best in class manufacturing metrics are 90% right? So you can go either way. So that's, that's you know, uh, basic risk management, I guess. Yeah, so risk you management. categorize that, and you might even accept certain risks, or mm -hmm. certain yeah. things might be no go. So right. I get that. But uh, how much of this is on your uh, clients? How much is it on your side that you decide? 
If they want us to decide, uh -huh. we'll put in the best practice. Okay. Okay. Some companies don't want to do that. Seriously, <laughs> I've had customers come and tell me, no, I want to be, I want to start 80. I don't want to be yellow or red. I want to start 80 now and then move to 85, 80, 90, you know. So, you know, in my opinion, uh, the next driving force in this kind of stuff is going to be the insurance sector. Yeah. And um, managing risks is the key to have a successful you know, insurance policy and, you know, sustainable uh, we didn't have something like this where I was last year. I have broke it. So we had a cyber security insurer. Okay. And we pay $30 million a year. So my question might be is uh, would you be able to mask all the data and just give out the scores, yeah, like legit scores for the insurance companies to evaluate their potential customers without being like siding with your customer, I guess? Oh, uh, I haven't thought of that. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. So based on your risk profile, you might get a better insurance. Yeah, that's the, that's the catch. I mean, and then the companies might be investing on this technology because they would pay less right. for premium. I mean, of course, it shouldn't be great in a way that they are paying less, uh, but that will also create some certain incentives yeah, no, for the insurance fine. companies yeah. to extend their uh, policies. We, we kind of look at it as something we feel that we can provide to the industry that helps them from being hacked. That's just our approach. Our was not from a monetary perspective how we maximize, you know, mm -hmm. revenue by partnering with different providers, right? Uh, one of the things you'll see, we do this on the cybersecurity and we also do this on the finance side, which is stock controls, right? Uh, on the stock controls, we provide, you know, any company is going to list it, how can you, you know, avoid segregation of your responsibility? So what happens there is you hire a lawyer or Ernest Young come in and they audit you and they look at all your user ID and say, this guy can create a vendor and pay the vendor. So what's stopping him from creating himself and paying himself? Right? So we have all these rules that go through and identify all those things and we can remediate them. Right? We are an automated solution. So as to your point, we talked with some some of the big five, right? And we said, this is a really great solution for you guys to use to automate your audit and, our, and for customers to reduce your audit costs, right? Uh, unfortunately, the, the big five don't want to reduce the audit costs because if, you know, they get to spend 300 man hours fixing your problem, they charge you for that, right? If they run this tool, it can be done in a day, you know, so it's just kind of a conflict of interest. But for companies, it's actually valuable. So if we have a lot of customers on that solution that the company buys, that they can reduce the audit cost. Because when the auditors come in, they don't find any problems. Any other last minute thoughts? Appreciate you guys coming down here. Thank you. It's really great.